you know, I mean, I, I think that we are living in this kind of quite critical moment in, in human history where we really have to make some serious decisions about our relationship with the natural world and we have to do it pretty quickly. So the exhibition starts out with um, a kind of quite bright white cube, a kind of standard space that you might expect to find in a contemporary art gallery, right? Contemporary art presentation. But then the narrative shifts very dramatically right away when you leave that room and you suddenly enter a wallpapered space, a space that is reminiscent of the, of the deep sea. And that kind of surprise where, you know, it seems like we're promising one thing and then suddenly we change the, change the rules of the exhibition, that happens repeatedly throughout the exhibition. And so uh, what you encounter are a variety of, of um, sort of non-traditional uh, spaces to show contemporary art with non-traditional lighting, everything's a bit dramatic, uh, the, it's not so obvious the way one proceeds through the exhibition, so there's an opportunity for viewers to make discoveries. So all exhibitions that have multiple rooms like this are, are sort of narrative in their structure in some way, but I think that um, curator Michael Dempsey and I uh, created a, a very interesting structure in which uh, the viewer is constantly surprised when they enter a new space, that there are different strategies, different uh, um, expectations of how the viewer might encounter the work. Well, there's a book called Our Plundered Planet, which is a very sort of early environmental text bringing to our consciousness the kind of threats to the natural world coming from the, the artificial world. The changes that we're making to the landscape are changes to evolution and changes to the, um, the natural structure of the planet that, that will have incredible consequences for the future. So it's, it's, a, it's an important work that really does, it does show that this, these concerns over the dramatic changes in the environment aren't just today's news. That people have been thinking about this for a very long time and we've slowly built up to the point where we're, we recognize it in everyday life as we do now. You know, I was really interested in, you know, when I, whenever I come to a place, I try to dive in a little bit and, and read a little bit about the social history, the culture, mythology, and because I do work on animal issues, um, the, the story of the salmon of knowledge, which is really charming and interesting and is a great story of, of uh, un the unexpected and mishaps, right? And so that became such a, a really exciting, um, exciting thing to imagine focusing uh, a work around. And again, this is also partially because of Limerick's position on this river that was once, you know, one of these great concentrations of, of, um, of diversity, you know, this, this kind of incredible place where there must have been you know, hundreds of thousands of salmon moving through that river at one time, and now we have a situation where there's, there's very, very few indeed. And so, um, you know, that, that idea of the salmon of knowledge, of, of knowledge and a certain kind of self-awareness returning, it becomes a very interesting uh, I, notion within this piece. You know, I, I'm interested in, in questions about the history of our thinking about the natural world, right? I want to try to understand how we got to this point uh, where we see the natural world in a very particular, somewhat strange way. So I want to be able to find those kind of benchmarks in that history. And natural history museums are really interesting places to do that. Partially, you know, when you enter a natural history museum like the one here in Dublin, it's like the closest thing we can ever get to time travel, right? We are suddenly in the mindset of a Victorian era scientist, you know, who organizes the world in a very particular way. I'm drawn to these museums because they also ask these really big questions. So I was very moved by how these, how museums of natural history ask these very profound questions of how did we get here? Where are we coming from? What is our relationship to the natural world? What are our, our obligations to other organisms? How do we organize the natural world? How do we think about it? How, is that, how does that change? So those big questions I've always found in the Natural History Museum and not always in the Art Museum. So I'm all about bringing those questions back to the Art Museum.
Yeah, I think that, you know, for me, like that notion of Voltaire and Poe is, is the idea of, of, you know, the rational and the irrational, these kind of, these kind of bookends in a sense. And that piece is a constant interplay between rational and irrational things. Imaginative and the fantastical uh, in, in an imaginary world, which is sort of symbolized by the basilisk in that piece, and the magical and fantastical in the real world, symbolized by the brontosaurus in that piece. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to me, that, that's a constant sort of battle, I think, in everyone. Uh, the, the Poe versus Voltaire, and how much Poe you have, or how much Voltaire you have, uh, really determines a lot of what kind of person you are. You know, I think that there's a lot of different ways artists can engage with environmental issues, like climate change. There's certainly, art is not a panacea that's going to solve these problems, but it's an important actor in that, and it's an important part of, of building a more general progressive culture of nature and, and, and a more progressive culture that responds to uh, changing our, our general attitudes toward the natural world and, and, how we, uh, and, and how we've been behaving toward the natural world as if it is limitless.